Hey guys, welcome back to this week's gun store vlog. This week we are going to talk about machine guns, machine gun ownership, and the nuances of the NFA. As always, I start off with some inventory stuff. If you don't care about that, scroll down to the comment section. I will have a comment pinned to the top with a timestamp to the question of the week. You can bypass all the inventory stuff. Anyway, if that all sounds good to you, stick around. That's coming up now. Okay, so starting off, I know in a lot of these vlogs, I show you guys a lot of the cool type, rare and unique stuff that we get in, but when you own a gun store, one of the most common sorts of things people bring through the door are semi-automatic 22s, bolt action 22s, things like single shot top break H&R shotguns, H&R revolvers. Uh, most of the stuff that we get in is stuff like that. So um, Again, I always like to sh kind of showcase the rare stuff, but uh, you know, I got to kind of give some credit to the uh, run of the mill stuff we get in all the time. Okay, so let's get into the rare stuff. One of the new things that we got in is the Copperhead uh, MPX by SIG. So these are pretty unique, actually at first glance, because a lot of people don't really know what these are sitting here on our wall. A lot of people have asked if this is some sort of weird lower receiver. <laughs> so. Um, Anyway, very interesting, very lightweight. I always like to do reviews in the format of comparing things with other firearms. I don't really know what to compare it to. If you guys have some ideas, let me know and I might do a comparison with this uh, coming out. But actually, very, very compact and small and very lightweight. I like this a lot, actually, pretty cool. Okay, now I do have a couple Thompson uh, M1A1 Thompsons I want to show you guys uh, sort of going on along the vein with machine gun ownership. What I have here is one of the auto ordnance semi-automatic M1A1 Thompsons, you know, clones essentially if you will with a really goofy and really long 16 inch barrel. Of course an original one would have a barrel chopped off about right here. If you can kind of picture that, it's about what a real one as issued in World War II would look like. Um, but anyway, these are a pretty faithful representation of an original M1A1 Thompson. They do shoot from the closed bolt chambered in 45. You can also get these in the pistol configuration with the 16 inch barrel. It's not a 16, it's a 10 inches, I believe, with a shorter barrel, but with no stock. You can form one and make one into an SBR, or Auto Ordnance does sell one that's complete as an SBR. You can buy one ready made. Now, this is a real M1A1 Thompson submachine gun. This is a fully transferable CNR M1A1 Thompson made by Savage, actually. So I just got this in. We are a class three dealer, and so we do buy and sell machine guns. If you have machine guns you wanna sell, please get in touch with me. I have some more machine guns coming in that I will surprise you guys with on the vlog. Now, since I do have these two, I will be doing a video very soon comparing this with the auto ordinance. So you can see how close they actually got on sort of replicating an original. Also, of course, I will have videos shooting this and stuff coming up within the next week or so. So anyway, let's go ahead and talk about how you own something like this. So this is a topic that has been discussed ad nauseum on YouTube and you can just search in machine gun ownership and you can find a bunch of videos that sort of explain this process. So I'm going to go ahead and pile on and explain to you as a dealer in machine guns what that is like from the standpoint of a uh, gun store. If you are thinking about getting into dealing in machine guns, what that sort of entails. So sort of like that. And then we will get into if you want to purchase a machine gun, how does that work? First and foremost, the number one question I get from people who come in is usually the first thing I you know hear from people who are sort of novices in the gun world is they see the bunch of the ARs and the AKs on the wall and they will say things like, are those fully automatic machine guns? By and large, when you walk into a gun store, everything you see on the wall is going to be semi-automatic. The quickest way you can tell if it is fully automatic and transferable it is it will have an obscenely high price tag on it. A fully automatic, fully transferable AK will go anywhere from about 18,000 if it's on a sear or up to 30,000, even 50,000 if it's a complete originally registered, original receiver Russian or Chinese AK, like a, a Vietnam bring back. I think a Type 56, I think they called them, uh, AK that was used in Vietnam, sold at Rock Island auction for like 50 something thousand dollars. Uh, but you could get AKs a little cheaper than that, but generally you're in about the 20 to $30,000 price range. Comparatively, the exact same firearm that is semi-automatic, of course, will run you six, $700 for like a Wasser 
or up to $1,000 gets you a premium AK like a, an arsenal, like 1500 bucks, somewhere around there. So why are machine guns so rare and why are they so expensive? Okay, well, machine guns can be classified basically in three ways. There is a fully transferable machine gun. A fully transferable machine gun is any machine gun that any person can purchase. Anybody at all who is a legally standing citizen of the United States who can purchase a Glock 19, you can also purchase a fully automatic, uh, fully transferable machine gun. That Thompson I just showed you is fully transferable. Any of you watching this video, if you know that you can go into a gun store and legally purchase a Glock 19, you can also legally purchase that Thompson. The problem is, like I said, the price point usually pushes people out of the market. The next classification would be a pre-86 dealer sample. So, without getting into too much of the specifics of the legalities, after 1986, no new manufacturer of machine guns could be manufactured and sold to the civilian market, i.e. why the prices are so high on those machine guns that were registered and are transferable before that 1986 cutoff day. It was a May, uh, that's what they call them, a pre-May sample is another way you hear about it, May of 1986. So in 1968, the GCA or the Gun Control Act was passed, which basically meant that there could be no new importation of machine guns that could be sold to the civilian market, among other things. So. Prior to 1968, anything manufactured or imported and was registered, that would have been fully transferable to the civilian market, transferable machine guns. After 1968, anything that is domestically manufactured it can be registered as transferable to the civilian market, but anything imported into, into the market, that would be then classified as a pre-86 dealer sample. And then 1986, the FOPA, Firearms Owners Protection Act, is passed, and that means that no new machine guns could be manufactured domestically for sale to the consumer market, which means after 1986, no firearms whatsoever can be legally transferred. So that brackets you into your three classifications, transferable, pre-86 dealer sample, and post-86 dealer sample. Now the price bracket on those is very different. I will use an M16 as an example. So a fully transferable, well, an M16 is a bad one. Let's use, um, let's use an MG34, because I know that those exist in all three classes. A fully transferable MG34 that anybody on the, in the, that is a legal citizen that can buy a Glock 19, fully transferable MG34 will run you between 30 to $40,000. A pre-86 dealer sample MG34, exact same firearm, no difference other than the classification of its legality, would run you about $12,000. A post-86 MG34, again, no different than the other two, other than its, registra its registration status, would run you maybe about $1,500 to $2,000. At that point, it's basically worth its parts and maybe a little bit of time that the person who made it put into building it. Okay, so the natural question that everybody asks themselves or the number one thing that people say when they see that price difference is, well, I'm just gonna get my FFL, get my SOT, and then I can go buy an MP5 for $1,500 and shoot it and have all the fun I want. Well, not so fast, it's a little bit more complicated than that, so let's back up and talk about first, how do you become a dealer in NFA items? Of course, NFA items are machine gun suppressors, SBRs, uh, anything like that, that you would have to go through a Form 1 or Form 4 to transfer to yourself. So, in order to be an FFL, or a, a, I'm sorry, a dealer in machine guns, I'm just gonna use machine guns instead of talking about all the other stuff, but the same rules apply on suppressors and everything. Um, you first need to apply and get your O1 FFL. Anybody who deals in firearms, any gun store you walk into in your area, that person is an O1 FFL holder or an O2 FFL holder if they're a pawn shop uh, or an O7 manufacturer, but some sort of variance of a general FFL which allows them to open, uh, buy and sell firearms, manufacture firearms if you're an O7 or do pawn brokering as an O2 FFL if you want to do that. The class three SOT, and SOT stands for Special Occupational Tax, is sort of something, it's, a, it's like a license that you tag on to your existing FFL. Really what it is, SOT, like I said, Special Occupational Tax, is a one time a year, $500 tax that you pay to give yourself the ability to buy and sell in NFA items. Now, like the name suggests, SOT, Special Occupational Tax, you have to be engaged in the business of dealing in those items. If you were audited and it's found that you were just buying them or you just have your SOT for the sole purpose of collecting, likely you know you will have the inventory will be forced to be sold or liquidated or confiscated and you will have your FFL pulled. 
Now remember also in order to get your FFL to start with, you will have to go through a lengthy interview process. If it's determined at any time through that interview process that you are just there to buy and sell guns as a personal hobby or for your own collecting purposes, they will not approve your license. They need to be reasonably satisfied that you are in fact procuring the license and the SOT for the purposes of running and operating a for-profit business. Now, as a dealer, once you've established your FFL and your SOT, you can begin dealing in NFA items, such as suppressors or machine guns. Now, the advantages are of that are in what we basically deal in. So I am a class three SOT, so I have an O1 FFL and then my SOT on top of that. And I keep that for the purposes of dealing in machine guns. That is all I do. I can deal in suppressors. I can do transfers on suppressors or anything like that. I don't do it strictly because the paperwork and the inventory and stuff like that is not of interest to me. I just keep the license for dealing in machine guns, which are typically high ticket items, which are fun to get in and deal in. And also they are a lot more lucrative when you buy and sell them. Now we get machine guns brought in here and sold to us maybe about five times a year. I mean, it doesn't happen very often, but there are people out there who do have machine guns in their collections, generally older people um, who maybe purchased them in the 80s, they've held on to them for a while, and then they get to that point where they decide to liquidate them, and then they bring them into stores like ours, we buy them, and then, you know, uh, you know, we can then resell them or, or do with what we will. You guys have seen videos on most of the ones we've done. We've had a Type 96 Japanese light machine gun. We've had an MG34, a 1919, an Uzi, a Mac 10 with suppressor, a Thompson. I've got another one uh, in transfer now. So we do get in a pretty healthy amount of machine guns that way. Now that process basically is say somebody comes into the store with a Glock 19. We basically, we can look at the firearm, we can make them an offer, and then if they like the offer, you know, we give them the cash, and then, you know, they give us the firearm, we draw up a receipt, we shake hands, and that's done. A machine gun is a little bit different. Since machine guns are registered items with the NFA, the National Firearms Act branch of the ATF, in order for them to basically transfer possession of that machine gun to us, we have to go through what is known as a Form 4 transfer. So if that Form 4, which is, you know, a Form 4 basically shows that it's a tax stamp, it's what you're paying for. It's, and I know that this is insanely complicated. I'm, I'm sort of glossing over this right now. But a Form 4 is a tax paid transfer. Sorry, I thought someone was coming in. It, it is a tax paid uh, transfer of ownership of that item. Anytime a machine gun, uh, goes from a private party to a dealer or from a dealer to a private party. So anytime a private party is either the transferee or the transfer or the machine gun has to go on a form four, which means we have to pay a $200 tax to the NFA branch of the ATF. And then a transfer on a form four from the private person to the business usually runs at about three months. Now, the interesting thing is, is generally what you do is you pay the person who has that machine gun, and it can be in the thousands or tens of thousands of dollars. To buy that machine gun, you draw up a contract or a purchase agreement, and then you have to watch them walk out the door with the $10,000 machine gun you just bought, and then wait three months before it shows up. Then that, when that, that for, approved Form 4 will be mailed to the customer's house, they will then take that form and then bring it in to the dealer, and then, you know, uh, the dealer then takes possession of the machine gun at that time. Now it is a little bit scary dealing in that, but you get a pretty good idea. You see the registration form there, so you know that the firearm is a registered and legal machine gun. Uh, so you do get a little bit of confidence there when you're dealing with a customer. Now in some cases, if it's a customer you've never dealt with, and say they brought in a transferable M60, which sells for about $60,000. You're not just gonna give some average guy off the street $60,000 for his machine gun. So you might, a lot of gun stores make arrangements like, hey, I will give you 50% of it now. So I will give you $30,000 of it now. And then once it is approved, bring in the machine gun and I will give you the other $30,000 and then that's it. Some dealers will just say, you know, I'm sorry, it's too big of a risk. We will do the transferring paperwork. Once you bring it in with the with the approved paperwork, then we will pay you. Now, a lot of people who have the machine guns don't necessarily like to do that because they're going through months and months of waiting and then they don't know if the dealer could back out at the last minute. And then they have then they will have to go send the NFA a cancellation letter and it's just a huge hassle. So most people in the machine gun world, it's pretty 
normal, you pay in full up front, and then you wait and hope you get your machine gun a few months later. <laughs> so it's a little unnerving in that regard. Now, if you are buying a machine gun from a dealer, it's the same thing. So if we are selling, like we sell a Mac 10, you know, we uh, we sold to a customer the most recent machine gun we've sold. The customer comes in and pays in full uh, for, for the entire machine gun. Uh, and then we do the Form 4 and we send it in. Now the wait on a Form 4 typically is running between about eight months to a year. You have to come in, you fill out an entire multi-page document. You have to bring in fingerprints and photos. If you are uh, transferring the firearm on a trust and that's opening a whole other new can of worms, then you know you have to provide fingerprints and photos and another uh, background check form on each person on your trust that's thanks to Obama and the 41P that he passed right before uh, leaving office. So it makes it even more complicated for people on your trust to be on your trust and for you to get that item. But anyway, you pay for the item, you go through all that paperwork and then you wait about eight months to a year for that phone call from your dealer to come on in and pick up your item. Now a lot of people worry about the registration process on machine guns and they worry that you know hey if i buy a machine gun or a suppressor that gives the atf the right to come in and inspect my gun safe at any time they like that is not true and i've never heard of that happening now of course if the police are in your home for any other nefarious reason i don't know um, after they shoot your dog they will probably look in your safe and if they see that machine gun and ask you for that that registration uh, paperwork if you don't have it therefore you have an unregistered machine gun that is uh, really 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 bad you'd probably be better off being caught with a pound of crack than you would an unregistered machine gun so it's best to kind of keep it legal and and follow those those rules and regulations on that as much as it pains me to say so now with that being said there are times when people do have machine guns they brought machine guns back as war trophies or stuff like that and during the amnesty never, never register them so there are a lot of machine guns that exist sitting in people's closets that are unregistered if anybody ever offers to sell you one of those machine guns for you know hey I've got this uh, old German MP40 in my uh, in my closet you know my grandpa died and he had it in a trunk in his in his attic or whatever do you want to buy it i'll sell it to you for a thousand dollars well at that point i would just say hey i'll buy the parts but you keep the receiver <laughs> you know for a thousand dollars but don't ever buy anything like that the number one question to ask is was it registered is there any paperwork with it a form for uh, or anything like that, that that shows that it was registered in the amnesty or that it was registered prior to the amnesty. Uh, that way you know that you can legally transfer and take possession and ownership of that and you are not violating any laws. Now with that being said, they could run an amnesty at any time. Actually, that's perfectly a plausible thing that could happen where they open up the registry and all those machine guns that are sitting in people's closets and under people's floorboards and stuff that are unregistered, that could allow them to then register those machine guns, making them legal transferable machine guns that anybody on the market can buy. The interesting thing is, is if that happens, that will introduce a new supply or a new source of inventory to the market that people can buy, thus driving down the prices of machine guns. Now, I don't think then a $20,000 MP40 would then become worth $1,000 if an amnesty opened because it's not like six million MP40s are gonna come out of the woodwork, but they might go from like 20,000 down to like maybe 15,000 temporarily, you know, if we get, 500 mp40 show up or something like that so an amnesty could always happen that's something to always consider if an amnesty were to open up and people could register those machine guns then in any of those machine guns that you may know about get them registered they could be worth a lot of money and no longer a prison sentence but i don't think an amnesty is very likely to happen in today's political climate unfortunately now people always ask the question about are machine guns great uh, means of investment well the the short answer is yes, but it's a little bit complicated. So machine guns, because of their lack of availability, they have gone up in value tremendously over the years. For example, a Mac 10 in 1986, you could buy brand new at a gun store for probably between three and $500 with its suppressor. Today, they're going for about $7,000 to $8,000. Uh, even three years ago, they were going for $5,000. So if you get into these machine guns, the value of them is exploding. Three years ago, an MP40 was worth about maybe 17,000. Now they're going for about 20,000. Three years ago, an MG34 was worth about 30,000. Now they're worth about 35,000. So as you can see, the value is just going up very, very quickly on a lot of these. Now, the one scary thing about uh, investing in machine guns, especially if you're going to buy a ton of them to invest in, is there's basically a, a few things. Keep in mind, uh, firearms are 
uh, mechanical pieces that do contain small explosions and shoot projectiles at very high velocity. Things can go wrong, parts can break, receivers can crack. Anything that happens like that, your machine gun's toast. You can't like, you know, drill off the serial number and like pop it on a new machine gun and then, hey, that's my new registered machine gun. In fact, it's funny because some people have tried that. Uh, taking, a, they took a Mac 10s, this was like 10 or 20 years ago when the Mac 10s were like, even then they were, you know, maybe two, three thousand dollars a piece. They tried to saw out the serial numbers and then put the serial number on other machine guns that would be more valuable, like M60s and stuff like that, and then pass them off as a registered gun. They got caught and, and that was a big no-no for them. But anyway, um, it's funny because it's been tried. But keep in mind the machine gun market is an artificial market. The prices of machine guns are high because of a law. If the law were to pass in either direction, for example, say they completely open up the registry and abolish the NFA, here's hoping, and all machine guns uh, become legal, uh, then a company like Ruger could stamp out a you know newly manufactured copy of the MP40 and sell it for seven eight hundred dollars, which means why would anybody pay twenty thousand dollars for an original MP40 anymore? Conversely, if they were to close the registry and not allow people to transfer ownership of their machine guns, assuming hopefully they at that point would have allowed a, a grandfather clause, then you know people can keep their machine guns, but then if you can't transfer them, you can't transfer them to your heirs or anything like that, then of course the value would be worthless. So again, as long as the rules stay the way they are, they could be a good investment, but if they change either for the better or the worse, then the investment's basically destroyed. So keep that in mind. There is that risk there for you. Anyway, guys, I will leave you with that. If you have any questions at all, please leave those down in the comment section. If you enjoyed this video, please let me know by hitting that like button. If you wanna see more gun store vlogs like this one, please subscribe to my channel and hit that bell notification button so you are aware when I am posting new content. Again, I am Chris with Marksman Shooting Sports in Westfield, Indiana. You are watching Marksman TV and I will see you next time.